Hello, good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. Let's begin with a look at ways to reform our electoral system. So the Electoral Reform Committee says that it is thinking about retaining the first-past-the-post system for state polls and introducing party-list proportional representation in parliamentary contests. So essentially what this means is that it wants to keep the original system for the state seats but perhaps change it up for the federal level. Yeah, what's exciting about uh, the new Malaysian, I think, you know, one thing that I really welcome is our ability to innovate the, the political system, right? So to think about innovation, not just in terms of uh, technology, which is always talked about, but also in terms of politics, so designing a system that best suits the 21st century, best suits the needs of the country. So there are many issues, right? So we're going to I think what the Reform Committee, Melissa, is trying to do is to address uh, previous problems, problems mm. in the current system, uh, 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 one of which is uh, the question of malapportionment. Well, that's the biggest problem, isn't it? It is one of the biggest problems because of the way in which it reduces the principle of the one man, one vote system. Uh, idea or notion, right? The idea that all our votes count equally. Uh, that's one thing. But there are other considerations, including designing a system that doesn't exacerbate the worst aspects of any kind of democratic system, right? So, for instance, we don't want uh, a system that encourages deepening uh, ethnic and racial division. Right. So that would be one uh, issue to talk yeah, about. Yeah, so that's, I guess, you know, one of these ways that you talked about kind of electoral innovations. But, you know, I mean, I just want to say that I think we should get used to hearing these terms a lot, especially with the Electoral Reform Committee about to make their proposals or in the next uh, few months, you know, looking at the ways to um, reform our electoral system. Now, so, if they, they're only due, Melissa, to... Next year, right? Uh, to yeah, announce mm. the new proposals by August next year. But in the in the run up, we should actually be yeah. talking. In fact, we should start very soon. And I would encourage everybody to go to Google, go to on <laughs> YouTube, and actually there's some excellent videos yeah. out there that they they explain things in very clear terms. Mm. Often, you know, using fruit or, or animals, but whatever <laughs> it is, they use ways of kind of um, sort of representing, yeah, simplifying, simplifying the, the issue. Process. And and demystifying it, mm. you know. And in many countries, uh, governments have gone to the to the people to yeah. referendums or plebiscites in order to get people to choose which system they would like sure. to graduate. I towards. think there's a lot of fear around jargon like malportionment and gerrymandering and first past the post. I remember, you know, when I was first covering elections, being very stumped by these terms and very intimidated by these terms. But actually, I think what we should do is normalize this as part of our lexicon. You know, part of voter education if we want to become a more developed democracy. Anyway, right. we're going to try and bring on the chairman of the Electoral Reform Committee to kind of explain a little bit more about this proposal. So watch this space. Now, in other news, we have slang or lawmakers appealing to consumers to understand the restructured free water policy for the state. So this is under the Ayer Darul Ehsan program. And under this program, only those in the B40 groups or households earning under 4,000 ringgit a month are entitled to free water. Other consumers will be charged a nominal fee for the first 20 cubic metres um, each month. So what do you think, Shirad? Do you think this is kind of tiered subsidy is discriminatory? Well, you know, so I can hear howls <laughs> of protests. disappointment and dip protests coming from people who have gotten used, like myself, to actually not paying for water at all. Uh, the question is whether some subsidies actually incentivize wasteful habits. So, so basically, if you don't have to pay X amount of, uh, you know, you don't have to pay anything for X amount of water, mm. will you then just waste water until you get to the point in which you start to have to pay and you sort of... Is that what we want? Yeah. And also there's another principle, which is that, you know, a subsidy, which is a cost to the taxpayer, should it go to the most needy? Yeah, so needs-based. Yeah, if you're earning more than 4,000 ringgit, isn't it reasonable to expect that you should pay 30, 40, 50 ringgit a month 
for your water use. Okay, well, this is similar to, I would say, perhaps the petrol subsidies, right? It's blanket subsidies. It's not really targeted. But if you wanted it to be targeted, a needs-based assessment would be quite expensive. And you might even get that wrong. Right, so this is where people understand that if you have... Uh, needs-based assessment, you have to put in place a kind of bureaucracy, an assessment system, somebody's got to be there, and it's a cost, it's again a cost to the taxpayer, mm. right? So it might actually be easier to have um, a kind of a flat rate. A blanket, blanket. yeah, blanket and subsidy. And then what you do is you give a coupon or you find a way of returning that money to the most needy so that they can pay it off, right? So uh, there's always a cost to things that sometimes are hidden from view, like, for instance, you know, a needs-based assessment system. Mm, all right. Well, another story that's gone viral is the plight of a popular homestay in Lengong, Pera, which is being evicted by the state government. So there's a court order to evict the operators of Permaculture Farm Stay, which was once featured in a National Geographic TV series for its homestay-style holidays, teaching guests about sustainable and off-the-grid living. So this has captured the attention of many netizens. It has because it has all the elements of a great story of people doing the right thing, uh, going back to nature, you know, caring for the land, teaching others to care for the land, and it's a it's a wonderful story of a of a uh, fairly young couple in their forties, mm -hmm. uh, people who perhaps uh, in this case uh, the uh, the wife uh, in this couple, uh, you know, it was a former accountant, I believe. You know, so these are people who could have made it good in the kind of mainstream society, but have devoted themselves to uh, to thinking about other ways of living, and now they're done hard done by. And this is the question: Why? Why is it that the Perak state government has chosen? to deal with them mm. in this particular way. I have to say, the optics don't look very good for the Perak state government. I mean, you're absolutely right. This is a kind of feel-good story. You know, this family, this farm is about sustainable living. It's They're educating the guests who come, uh, teaching visitors how to live off the grid. So in this day and age of, you know, uh, awareness of climate change, this is a, a real story that Malaysia should be highlighting. And governments should be protecting, yes. it seems, depending Supporting on the, too. the values of that government. So, you know, we're often focused on looking at Pakatan Harapan at the federal level. Are we looking at the conduct of Pakatan Harapan governments, indeed of all governments, mm -hmm. past-led, uh, AMNO-led in Perlis and Pahag, uh, when it comes to at the state level. And so that, I think, is where this needs to kind of operate scrutiny of state-level policies. You know, the bad guys, timber companies, again, if you see some of the pictures and that, that are there in the story of forests being cleared by timber companies that are essentially, you know, spoiling the environment. At least that is the allegation. Mm. So... You know, on the on the on the on balance, what is the state government of Perak's values? I think that's yes. what we're asking. And uh, on that note, I mean, what has been the state per, uh, the Perak state government's track record when it comes to protecting orang asli rights within the state? Right. Anyway, this is an interesting story, one that needs to be unpacked further. But we'll be keeping a close eye on this one. Now, coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to take a closer look at the developments in the Food Panda Riders dispute. Stay tuned to consider this. Welcome back to Consider This. Melissa and Sherrod here with you this evening. Now, the think tank Institute for Democracy, Democracy and Economic Affairs, or better known as IDEAS, believes that the government should not intervene in the decisions of individual companies, but rather focus on developing the overall business environment. Now, of course, this comes after Youth and Sports Minister Said Sadiq, through his support behind Food Panda Riders protesting a new payment scheme in the company. Joining us on the line to discuss this further, we have Sharizan Johan, lawyer and political secretary to Iskandar Putri MP, Lim Kit Siang. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening, Shah. Now, do you, do you agree Thank that you. it might create concerns within the business community that the government is prepared to intervene in the decisions of individual companies when things get political? 
I think um, um, it would create that concern, and I wouldn't be surprised if there is now that concern. But also at the same time, I think there is already an expectation when the matter first erupted that the government should at least look into the matter uh, because it, it, it has entered national discourse when, when we, we saw, for example, uh, the strikes by some food pilot riders and so on. So there was already an expectation that, that at the very least the government should look into the matter. And although I think this issue, although it concerns uh, only a few hundred riders throughout Malaysia, but I think what we have to look at is how it represents the larger issue or the larger question uh, as to whether there is a need to regulate what is uh, known now as gig economy. Uh, we must remember that these riders are, are not uh, uh, employees of Food Panda. Uh, they are not in a contract of employment. So with such disputes, they, can't, they cannot really bring the dispute to the Labour Office or to the Industrial Court. So legally, it would appear that there is little recourse available to them. So in that situation, I think there is an expectation that the least that the government can do is to listen to, to, to both parties, because they have done that, and to try and perhaps mediate the dispute. Well, you know, what's very interesting is uh, the conclusion that the government seemed to have come to, uh, Shah, which is to advise the company to return to its original terms of contract. Now, uh, I know on social media that you have uh, clarified or pointed out to the fact that this is merely advice. But isn't there strong pressure, especially in a context like Malaysia, that when government gives advice, you know, private companies wanting to ensure a good relationship with government would... Uh, uh, will sort of buckle uh, uh, to such demands? I think um, uh, we must look at it as what it is, which is, which is advice. And really, if uh, Food Panda believes that, uh, you know, the, the new uh, uh, framework that they have uh, prepared for the riders and for the payment and all that is the right way forward, um, there's actually nothing that uh, Cabinet or the government can do about that. And, and I think... It will come to a point where, um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's something which Food Panda feels that, you know, they simply cannot follow this advice, I'm sure they will take the decision to, to proceed as it is. Uh, but of course, there's always the public uh, uh, backlash, perhaps. You know, people are talking about boycotting and things like that. So there's always that in the background. It's not just pressure from the government. And I think the larger pressure is from the public because of the fact that this has become a national issue right now. Well, you know, it seems like also politicians are creating the situation to make it a national issue. Uh, if Is it possible that the government has created in the minds of those young riders the expectation that the government is on their side? That, in fact, uh, if Food Panda decides not to take up the advice of the government or cabinet, as it's come out, uh, that, you know, those riders will say, well, you know, this is a government directive. I mean, do you think there's a possibility of a misunderstanding of government's role in labor and management disputes? I think there is a possibility of that. Uh, I cannot discount the possibility of uh, that expectation. And, and I must say that I was not present uh, at the uh, meeting between the riders and uh, the minister. So I'm not sure what was the promise that was made uh, during that meeting. But I think, I would think that at the very least, um, they would appreciate the fact that there's, you know, the government is at least willing to, to, to listen to their grouses. And, and apparently from the reports, it's not just people from Food Panda, there are also other people involved in the gig economy. So I think at the very least, they would be appreciative of this fact. I, I, I'm not sure whether there were actually promises or assurances made uh, by the government to say that we will fix this issue, issue or we will uh, uh, make sure that Food Panda reverts to the, to the original uh, scheme or not. Uh, so there is that possibility, and I, I, I cannot discount that. But I think that can be uh, a result if the government from the start uh, uh, tells uh, the, the, the Food Panda riders that, look, you know, uh, we can at most listen to you, we can perhaps suggest, but at the end of the day, since there is no regulations, we cannot compel anyone to follow our 
uh, advice. Okay, so it is about managing the expectations of these riders. Now, Shah, you mentioned a bit earlier that these riders are not employees of these types of companies, right, within the gig <clears throat> economy. Now, with your legal background, Shah, what kind of legislation do you think is needed to govern and regulate the gig economy? I think, uh, first of all, we need to recognise in Malaysia, uh, a lot of people actually get involved with uh, uh, the so-called gig economy, not because it's flexible or because you know they are they, they, they want to earn extra money but some of them actually rely on on this gig economy uh, uh, as a form as a source of income as a primary source of income uh, so it, to a lot of these riders they, they really don't have any other choice uh, but to go to 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 these uh, uh, companies and and you know carry out this work uh, and, and so once we recognize this I think it's easier for us to look at what sort of regulations that we need. Now, I do also agree that there cannot be over-regulation. You know, we don't want that either. There must be still some flexibility uh, accorded to, 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 to these uh, setups. Uh, so I think finding the balance is key. And I, I think that's the reason why Cabinet has tasked a committee of three ministries to look into this. Personally, um, I will look at three areas. I think number one is the commission. Um, for example, in, in, uh, for e-hailing services, uh, the regulations have kept commission at 20%, so it cannot be more than 20%. So perhaps we can look at uh, something similar for, for these delivery services. Uh, number two, payment. Um, when should they be paid? Is there a, a time frame? Uh, you know, and things like that. And number three, I think welfare. Now, again, this is this is I think the most trickiest because we can't we cannot expect the uh, the, the companies to start paying EPF or, or something similar. But what if you know this this uh, riders in the course of uh, them making a delivery they, they get into an accident? You know, is there a form of protection? Mm -hmm. So this is something that we we should look at. At least some limited form of protection. Uh, perhaps with Soxo and, and, and some, or something similar. Sure. Do you take the criticism uh, that uh, what the government seems to be doing is not focusing on creating an environment to, to get that other side of the economy, the one that creates secure jobs and, and secure employment and so on, uh, but has kind of tried to gang press the, the, the gig economy enterprises to kind of conform to that other model and thereby we might actually fall between benches and end up with uh, hurting the gig economy but not actually producing uh, real jobs either. So, you know, is there a possibility the government is sending the wrong signals by kind of focusing on the gig economy and wanting to regulate it in this kind of way? I think the government can do both. Uh, the government can look at the gig economy because right now, as I said, we can't run away from the fact that you know it it, it does uh, uh, represent a source of income for a lot of Malaysians, young Malaysians. Uh, but at the same time, the government should also, and I think the government is doing, uh, uh, should also look at you know how to create more jobs, how to to increase the wages. I think these are the big ticket items that the government is trying to focus on. But of course, those uh, things would actually require. Um, I suppose uh, more implementation, more work, and also because of the current economic situation, it might not be easy. So in the meantime, uh, while we are working, or the government is working towards this, this big ticket item, at the same time, we do have a sizable number of Malaysians who are involved in the economy. So we should also at the same time look at you know, trying to, to, to put some regulation uh, on these sort of uh, uh, setups. All right, thank you so much, Shah, for joining us tonight. Now, we will be back with more on Consider This, so stay tuned. <laughs>
Thanks for staying with us on Consider This. Melissa and Sharad here with you. Now here's what we want you to consider tonight. A story that caught our attention was one coming out of Sabah. Now the immigration department there has highlighted cases of foreign men who were quote unquote, willing to marry older women so that they could stay on and operate their businesses in Sabah. So even the Deputy Prime Minister, Datuk Sri Dr Wan Aziza, has commented on this case. So what do you think, Sharad? of the way the media has framed this story. Yeah, I think it's not just the media, <laughs> Melissa, you know, framing the story. It's how government thinks about the actions and behavior of uh, its citizens, right? So in this case, older women who are citizens of the country are seen to be uh, victims of uh, of younger men, in this case from Pakistan, who have an agenda. Now, the idea that somehow the older women don't know better don't understand uh, the, the motivations or the quid pro quo that might happen between them and these young men is, I think, an extraordinary oh. uh, form of condescension. <laughs> I think it's both ageist and sexist. Oh. And I think, and we and should then, be outraged. You should. I, I should you, be outraged. You, I mean, this I idea am. that, you but know, uh, that uh, they're willing to, mm. you know, to marry older women. Don't well, I, I, my read on this is, is a bit different from you. So you are saying that the women are being seen as victims of this. Whereas what I'm reading, some of the media reports that I'm reading is that the media has framed it as these men sanggup berkahwin dengan wanita berusia are willing to be married to older women and i might read this termasuk uh, wanita berusia termasuk yang berstatus nenek so I mean, the way that's been framed, that is ageist and I think very sexist yeah, because so if the positions were reversed, no one would be questioning the story. If it was an older man and a younger woman, would we be reporting this in the news? It might or might not be, but I think uh, ageism is something that often uh, gets underreported. The assumptions that older people don't know better, right? Uh, in this case, because it's ageism and sexism coming together. but. At the end of the day, government seems to think it knows better than those women, that they don't know that they're being taken advantage of, which I think is essentially the thing. <laughs> now, the government might have a, a public policy uh, you know, interest and in that they might think, well, these are undesirables, right? So, but who is to determine what is undesirable? Mm. We, we, we assume that government has some right to make those determinations, but at the end of the day, especially in matters of love, and marriage, which are the, the on the surface, what's happening? Should government uh, get uh, you know stick its nose in the in the business, the private affairs, the private of affairs of uh, women, old or young? I have to say though, I mean, that there, there have been many cases. I feel like as a woman, our citizenship is always in question. The loyalty to the country, right? Whether you know you're giving away citizenship to foreign men, or as a woman who has married a former for a foreign partner and is abroad who has uh, given birth, that child you cannot get. You know, you can't transfer your citizenship to the child born abroad. So I feel like you know, in in a way, women's citizenship are always being put into question. You constantly have to prove your loyalty that you are. Are, you know, a citizen and safeguarding your citizenship. Well, also, you know, uh, with the, the question of citizenship as a whole, both uh, male and female uh, citizens of the country uh, often find themselves, you know, up against government that thinks it knows better and can take away their right to choose. Mm. And I think, you know, all tonight, you know, all, all, throughout all the this stories the that we've theme of the story. It right? is, in fact, the question of uh, strengthening citizenship uh, and making sure that the state doesn't assume, doesn't overreach. Right, and I'm hoping that media covering the story will get the framing right. Let's not go for the cheap clickbaity headlines. All right, that's all we have for you today. I'm Melissa Idris and with me, Sharad Kutten. We will be back tomorrow at 10pm for another edition of Consider This, only on Astro Awadi. Good night. <laughs>